Good afternoon, Wilkinson here. So, I don't know, a month ago I put out a blurb on a couple of Facebook groups and I said, I need people with interesting stories to come here and I wanna chat with them. So today I have Jason Menino. He's here and he's got an interesting story. In fact, he's got several. It's like we're sitting here, we always talk a couple minutes before the, uh, the podcast is recorded and I, I say, you know, what are we gonna talk about? And we go down, there's a lot of rabbit holes we could go down here. So we, neither of us have any idea where we're going, but here we are. Say hi, Jason. Hi, it's great to be here. I appreciate your time and your willingness to hear my story. It's gonna be a good one. Tell a little about yourself where you grew up, you know, you can go down whatever track you want, but just let my listeners get a feel for you a little bit. All right. Well, I, uh, I'm i an East Coaster at heart. To be more specific, that would be New York, New Jersey. I was born in Brooklyn, raised in South Jersey, closer to Philly. I, you know, started my, my first passion at that time was uh, in high school was I found theater and performing and that has stuck with me throughout my entire life. I call that the longest love affair I've ever had. And then I went to undergrad conservatory at Rutgers and then found my way through some spiritual paths into to the West Coast after 23 years of life. And that was started in San Francisco. And I've been on the West Coast for, gosh, since December 1995. The whole, this, the entire time I've been between San Francisco and LA and back to San Francisco and then back to LA. And now in Palm Springs. <laughs> now in Palm Springs. Well, we can talk about that. Tell a little about your family. What what was your situation growing up? Growing up, let's see. We first, I lived in Brooklyn for the first six months of my life. We moved to Pennsylvania and then my dad moved us to Jersey where he opened an Italian restaurant. So it was my mom, my dad. I'm the second born of twins with an older brother. So technically the youngest. By the time I was around seven, um, I used to say my dad left us, but that you know, looking back and kind of rearranging the memories to be more based in truth is that my mother changed the locks, which she did for perfectly reasonable reasons. Um, I don't blame her at all at that time. And so, you know, she was raised to be a woman who had children, got married and took care of them. And so she did not have a huge career at that time and was left without a lot of resources and ended up on government assistance and things like that. But I consider her, you know, extremely proud to say that she was a classic uh, government resources, quote unquote, to work woman, went back to the school, was able to maintain our house, raised three kids, kept the job for 30 years until she unfortunately uh, passed away at 61 in 2003. Wow. And I'm assuming you're gay because you live in Palm Springs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Safe assumption. And I was in the, and I'm in theater. So oh, that's I mean, no okay. offense to the straight people in the performing arts world, but yeah, well, there, I think there are four of them now. Right? <laughs> well, it's kind of an interesting thing. So your brother is also gay. My twin brother is yeah. also gay. Yes. And who came out first? I came out first. My, so I, he beat you out of the shoot. He when beat you were me born. out of the shoot and then I beat him out of the closet. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Are you in touch with him still? Oh, yeah. He now lives in Los Angeles as well. He lived in New York for most of our adult life. And then I moved back to San Francisco in 2015 to take a job at UC Berkeley. And right around the same time, he had met somebody and got into a relationship with somebody in San Francisco and moved at that time. So we got to spend a lot of time together on his visits to San Francisco. And then he moved to San Francisco right when I moved back to LA. In all honesty, did not last in San Francisco when I moved back. For very long. It was just a, com a completely different city in 2015 than it was when I had lived there in the 90s. But during the pandemic, that his relationship ended and he made the transition to Los Angeles. So we overlapped in the same city <laughs> since the first time we probably, probably since, yeah, since the first time we had lived together in our childhood home for about a year. Until I moved here full time into my home here in, in the desert. And how long have you been in Palm Springs? I've been in Palm Springs since March of 2021. I closed on my house November 2020 and then moved full time in March. Okay. So you're a newbie. I'm still, a, I'm still pretty kind new, of a yeah. newbie. So what have you done with yourself? Talk about some of your story here. I started in my undergraduate career at an acting conservatory within, you know, I'd been single minded for so long throughout high school. And then those first two years in a conservatory, there's just no time to explore other interests. And then by my junior year of college discovered that I did have other interests I wanted to explore. My interests were always either performing or they, or they were in a category that I call psychology, transformation, spiritual kinds of work, very, very progressive sort of work. But also 
I met a boyfriend at the time who awakened the activist in me and I got very involved in HIV work and queer activism work and ended up doing HIV prevention as my first job out of college. Then I met the Radical Fairies, which I consider to be my first sp real spiritual awakening. Went back to Philadelphia where I was living and working at the time and wanted more of the spiritual work. And I, how, I, how, how would you define Radical Fairies? Because not everyone listening is going to be familiar. I would define Radical Fairies as a, a movement, if you will, that began, that was first called by Don Kilhefner, who's a Jungian analyst in LA, who I got to meet. Uh, and spend some time with in therapy. And oh my goodness, Harry Hay, who almost God, one of our, you know, our real gay forefathers, whose name I almost lost. The Radical Fairies, they called the first Radical Fairy Gathering. And what that was, was a call of queer counterculture and frankly, what I call, you know, we are, paganism. So getting back to the earth, getting back to the land, queer counterculture things like that. That's who the radical, I, I would say the radical fairies are. So running through the woods with running flower, through the flowers woods. in your hair. Right? Absolutely. And it would do me no good because I'm bald. So lots but of gay I, hippies I, with I the did, fairies. Uh, I did go to one radical fairy thing years ago in, um, I think it was Brighton Bush, Oregon. Yeah. That, that was pretty fun. It was pretty interesting. I got to go to the first, I, I don't know if it was the first, but it's Really, the, the, probably the most well-known on, on the planet sanctuary is the Short Mountain Sanctuary, it's called in Tennessee, where they're real sort of, quote unquote, if they have a headquarters, <laughs> that's where it would be, where there's you know, no electricity, nothing, wow. of, you know, they live, they really live off the land there. It's beautiful. Well, Brighton Bush has natural hot springs, so it's really cool. Oh, there. wow. That's yeah, fantastic. That's, that's very cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of it burned down during one of the fires, I think, last year, so. Oh, wow. But, that's and then sad. my other familiarity with the uh, radical fairies was i i as a photographer i did their one of their magazine covers once so that yes. was a, that was a wild cover <laughs> and tell me the name of that i forgot the name of that again um our rfd rfd radical, radical fairies fairy diary, diary something digest like, i think digest, it is okay. there's diary a digest i'm pretty sure all right so you started on your spiritual path really start although i consider studying acting a very spiritual work it's very you know at least what i was doing which was sort of very method oriented is all about going inward to identify who you are who your authentic self is and how you bring that into the context of a of a of a circumstance or role in a in a play or whatever you're working right. on but yes radical fairies was the big one and when i got back to philly i wanted to to, to find more of that kind of work not as a as my the work that i was doing but more the work that more of my own transformational work. Right. So I found something called conscious breath or at the time that w what was known as rebirthing. And that is just a huge, another huge awakening, just incredible connection with spirit and the divine. And it's the most, for me, it's been one of the most direct ways to make that connection. And through that. <clears throat> so the breathing actually uh, yeah. is an energetic thing, right? It's an energetic yeah. thing. As you yeah. breathe, you, it's hyper oxygenating, you awaken yourself on an energetic level. It's the first time and the only time really that I would say I've, and this is going to, this might be out there for some people that I, <laughs> you know, I knew I was a particles moving in space. Let's say I was, I was well, energy. That's what we are. Yeah. All, all we are is energy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, um, another huge awakening. And that's sort of what re made me realize that I was not wanting to be in a full-time job in graduate school at that time. I was like, Oh my God, I had, there's a, no, there's a whole world out there. And I was, I had been accepted to grad school at, at the time, but I moved to San Francisco. Oh. Go, go back. Don't let's, let's go back to that breathing thing. So what happened actually? Can you talk a little bit more about it? What did you experience? Gosh, well, you know, I experienced, you know, in the early sessions that I had, I experienced some trauma. I, I realized that there are some things that needed to be healed and it goes all the way back to, I mean, this is going to sound really out there, but it goes all the way back to the birth canal and being left and realize oh, when your brother exited. And yeah, you I remember okay, being wow. in a dark space with a light, with a, with a very small light at the end and feeling like I was being, I was being abandoned. Left. Yeah. And I had to process that. And I did, you know, began the work of healing the, you know, the relationship that I had with my brother. We all, you know, not that there was any major issues, but we all have our stuff, right? So really began to bring that into consciousness and to resolve whatever I needed to resolve there. And just now, was he on the same page with us or did you have to do all the work yourself? But he's on the same page when the idea that there was certainly some issues growing up, as right. you can imagine, twins sharing the same room and as, as children might have. Right. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but I definitely continue. He took your toy truck, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I continue. You know, one of the one of the things that I continue to carry with me from that is this idea that I need my space. Absolutely need my space. I live alone right now, and I've lived alone. Lived always lived alone in L.A. And yeah, I just that's hard for me to live. With. Yeah. Have you had partners? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But you don't live together. Typically not. Typically not. We cohabitate in many ways, but right. I've always had my own place. You can send them home. Yeah. <laughs> I can shut my door at some point. <laughs> it's like grandkids. Okay, I'm done. Go. That process got me really clear that I, was, I moved to San Francisco and was sort of, you know, not wanting to be in full-time work at the time. I trained as a massage therapist at that time, but building that business and frankly in San Francisco required crossing boundaries that I did not want to cross. I've no so they judgment. Want, they wanted a little more than a massage. <laughs> yeah. People wanted a little more than a massage. Right. I have no judgments on it and no judgments about people who deliver that as part of their profession, but it's not, it's not a boundary I wanted to cross. And so that right. was not working. And then I ended up moving into a corporate life and doing a, uh, starting my recruiting career and my search work. So radical fairies to come. To, to recruiting. recruiting. To corporate, to huh. corporate work. Yes. <laughs> corporate recruiting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that. Well, I kind of, at this point, I would say that a lot of people or a lot, you know, there are people out there for whom recruiting has evolved and they choose it as a career. At the time that I started recruiting, it was something that many people would often say, including myself, I fell into it. And I did. I left a, a receptionist job actually at the time of part-time work and looking at job boards and Way, there was a time when I was looking for temp work and sitting, I remember sitting in an office of a temp agency and thinking, wow, how cool would it be to spend your day helping people find work? That was long before I ever knew I was going to be a recruiter. And it was in, but it was in San Francisco. And then I, I fell into the work. I started working on the agency side at Apple One, which is a large temp employment agency, well known. And then I uh, moved to LA and began in-house work in the entertainment industry. I've worked at many of the studios and then was fortunate enough to, in 2007, and to really begin to take on, continue to take on my spiritual work and realizing that I wanted to be more of a leader in that world. And so I went to graduate school and got a master's degree at a university uh, called University of Santa Monica, where they only taught something called spiritual psychology. So I have an MA in spiritual psychology and began to build my coaching business and then really began to align my recruiting business with more mission-driven, purpose-driven, nonprofit types of organizations. Right. So you melded the two. Into, I was into, able to meld the two, yeah. yeah. I mean, my original goal, once I when I left the conserva acting conservatory and became an activist, I was going to go get an MSW and I was accepted to an MSW program, which is a master's degree in social work. And then a decade later, realized that I was doing recruiting in organizations where I would have been working as a social worker. So hmm. yes, those two those two worlds crossed in that way. And you're doing that now? I am doing that now. I do executive search. I do career coaching. A lot of recruiting turned into executive search work about a little over a decade ago. And all of that has been either in higher education, nonprofit, mission-driven kinds of organizations. I, I co-implemented the first executive search function for University of Southern California. I built and implemented it at UC Berkeley. I've done it in some nonprofit healthcare organizations. And now I'm starting to go down the entrepreneurial path and build my own search business. I was uh, going to say, do you work for a company or do you do your I'm thing? looking, I'm really looking at, at melding all of these worlds together. And part of that includes working for myself at this point. Cool. So but currently that that's on the planning stage, right? Uh, I just signed, I just got my first contract signed. Oh, did you? So, yeah. So are you still with a bigger company now or yourself doing I work that? I for or an I... agency, but I'm not, I don't want to go too into that. Right. Right. So that's going to be in your past. Yes, okay. it is. Um, yeah, so that's all coming together. And I'm also looking at taking my career coaching and coaching work out of the shadows that's kind of been in the background and putting that back in the forefront along with building this executive search sure. business. And since I moved to the desert a year and a half ago, really, really haven't stopped performing. So that really? as well. Talk yeah. about that. Well, initially, I met a friend on Facebook who invited me to the roost. He was like, every, every Tuesday night they do karaoke. We, a bunch of us get together for dinner and we, we sing karaoke. And at first I didn't go cause it was still very much the height of the pandemic. And when I did go the very first night, had a couple drinks, 
Um, and within a very short period of time, I was on stage singing and it, it completely relit that spark. Um, and people were very pleased and acknowledging. I was like, oh my goodness. And didn't realize that this friend that invited me was also on the board of one of our local gay men's courses called Modern Men. And so I, be, I, I auditioned for them and sang in their fall concert 2021, which was a full brand new commission. And then I was also invited to take a baritone role in a smaller 16 men's ensemble called Acabello. And I performed in their last two shows and we're about to do our third show. The last show we did was a Stephen Sondheim tribute at Coachella Valley Rep. And we're now doing in October, the weekend of October 7th, we'll be doing a James Bond tribute. It's the 60th anniversary of James Bond. When the great oh, really? thing about that music is it crosses so many decades at this point. Right. It's like completely from now back to the 60s when they started. We'll be, we'll be covering all of those decades in some way. And you said you were in some kind of opera. Like, yes. What, what's that And <laughs> I've been studying voice with Doug Nagel and this Tiger Bear Productions is the production company putting on the West Coast premiere of an opera called Unbound. They approached him looking for people to, you know, for auditions and he submitted me for this role and I landed a lead role in this one act chamber opera called Unbound, which is an incredibly unique, innovative, progressive story and opera. It's uh, I'm really excited to be a part of it because of you know, part largely because of how unique and new it is. It, this is well, the I most... interviewed someone else recently that I think is involved in that. Yes. You said it was kind of kinky. <laughs> oh yeah, it takes place in a sex club in Stockholm. Um, the role that I play, he's he's looking. To, you know, he's had these fantasies for a really long time that have been um, un, unexplored, and he goes to this sex club in Stockholm to see if he can live out a fantasy and. And that's what he does. And he meets a couple of guys along the way that it doesn't work out with for one reason or another, including things like consent. Um, and then he meets a guy that he can really does make a connection with who offers him this experience and he goes through with it. And, and the beautiful thing is that, yes, it's very much about, it very much takes place in a sex club and it's very suggestive and sensual. It's an erotic, but not sexual. So yeah, on this, I would say on the surface level, that's the story, but it's so much more than that. It's I mean, my character is a person looking to explore something that he's had in, in, in the shadow for a long time and bring that into the light. And he does. And the great, beautiful thing about this, this production is that that's what that is what it does it shows you that this does not have to exist in the dark it can be in the light and it can be a transformative even if from you know from where i'm coming from the role of spiritual experience well sex club and opera that's kind of a nice combo yeah it's pretty amazing very it's very <laughs> not something you'd really very unique be looking for and uh, i won't get too much too much more into it but right. you know, imagine hearing the kind of music you might hear in a sex club with opera Wow. Sung all over that. It's pretty, <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting and exciting. Well, I've never been to a sex club, so I don't know, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I don't any, I don't anymore. This is the first sex club I will have been to oh, really? in this show wow. in many, many years. Wow. Privacy of my own home is fine, but it's, yeah. What, what else is on your agenda here? Oh my goodness. I'm <laughs> in this opera. I'm preparing with Acabello to do a show early October. And I just, as I mentioned, got this you know first contract signed for two executive level searches that I'm doing. And I'm yeah, trying, yeah, 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 and, yeah. And I'm what? trying, and I'm trying to get to the gym twice a day. I don't okay, well, think yeah, there's but what else? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty busy to me. So we were talking about, talk a little about personal growth, your journey on that. Gosh. Okay. So we talked about radical fairies and we talked about the conscious breath work and, and my massage therapy work work and my my spiritual psychology master's degree and the beautiful thing about the spiritual psychology degree and the work in that program is that it's not although although people go into it as a profession they don't certify psychologists but you can take that and people have gone on to get their mft and combine those the work really is about your own process and your own your own working your own and working your own process and we we all supported each other so the training was basically us working with other students who were also doing the work um and it, it you know there's so much that went on in that program i i can in my second year of that program, I completely resolved and healed my relationship with my father. Uh, and, to and they actually call it, it's a relationship project. It's one of the big projects of your second year. 
And typically when they make the assignment, the first thing they say is the person that you just thought you could never do is the person that you should probably do. Oh, really? Yes. And did you think of him when they said that? I don't know. I may have thought of him after they said that. Okay. All right. (laughs) But I did. And what's uncanny about it is that I did not know at the time that I had decided that I was going to do the work on healing this relationship that he had been diagnosed with liver cancer and only had a short period of time left. And And he literally had the time that I worked on resolving and healing this relationship and moving into a space of love with my dad and embracing him as my father, perhaps for the first time during that whole time, he was struggling, you know, going through this cancer challenge and, and that was it. And then he was gone right at a, right, right when I got to that place of, oh, this is complete. Bam. Wow. He exited the planet. So did you have contact with him? You're, you said your mother locked him out or changed the locks when you were <laughs> six or seven. Did you? Were you in contact growing up? Or it was, was a it... bit of an estranged relationship growing up, frankly. Okay. Um, but you knew where he was and you... I knew where he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so you were in in person doing the healing with him then? It wasn't all no, internal? No. It was all internal? He was in, living in Florida at the time, and I was uh, in Los Angeles. No, it was not all internal. It was, was that, Did you meet him at all, or was it all... I had decided that I was going to visit him, not knowing that that was going to be his funeral. Oh, that, so he was gone when you yep. visited. Wow. Yep, pretty wow. amazing. Pretty transformative, Was actually. there any verbal communication? Yes, or? there was over the phone. Okay, so you did that. Yeah, okay. and I had said to a friend, you know, in the work that we did within the classroom setting, uh, a friend, a fr- not a, not really a friend per se, but a colleague in the, in the program asked me what I would have wanted to hear from my father uh, if I do go visit him, because I was exploring that at the time. Right. And my answer was, I, I want him to say that he's, that he's proud of me. And the last phone conversation that I had with him, I let him know that I was completing this graduate program. Um, and that is, we, although it wasn't in the same room, it was it, it, it was over the phone. He said exactly what, I, what wow. I had asked for. He said, I'm proud of you. That's very cool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's, wow. it's spirit is, is wild sometimes. <laughs> now did your, was your brother, the twin brother, was he involved in any of that as well? Or would you just do all this on your own? It was between you and your No, father. I really did all of it. All. It was really between okay. me and him. What's your relationship with your older brother? Good, good. He's been, he's lived in Philly, still does, still has a home there, although he is transitioning to the San Francisco area as well. Uh, I don't talk as much with my brothers as I might like. It's not like that, but it's also, but we're very connected. I really feel like, you know, we have a familial bond regardless of how much we see or talk to each other. That's how I, it's, 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 cool. it's something that I have, um, that I have faith in whenever, when we do see each other, it's very loving and supportive and right. yeah. Now he's straight, right? He the is. older one? Yeah. But he's moving to San Francisco. Maybe he's on his way. Well, no, he's not. But he's not moving to San Francisco just for the hell of it. He's moving for a job or he's something. Been, he's, he's been working with uh, an old friend of his that we were all friends growing up. And oh, he, cool. this friend has a, uh, a boutique financial services firm where he's the operations executive. So you've had a very circuitous life. Yes. Down many paths. <laughs> yeah, it's what, pretty... what are, tell me three things, main things you've learned. On that oh journey. gosh, I've learned to be grateful. Grateful. One. And don't just give me a word. Tell me a little about it. Well, I practice gratitude every day. The first okay. thing I do would be when I be when my alarm goes off is remind myself to think of five things that I'm grateful for, and then I, when I go to bed, I remind myself. Uh, I do a review. I try to. I try to mo- most of the time. It's not every night. Sometimes I go to bed. <laughs> right. But when I go to bed, my my typical practice is to uh, review the day and and think and and look at what occurred and identify the thing that I'm most grateful for that occurred during the, the course of the day. And I believe that you know one of the ways that we create more of what we want is to be grateful for what we have. True. So number, number, number one, that's number one, <laughs> <laughs> number two, you know, it's funny on Facebook, just before we started this conversation, a friend of mine who had been in my graduate program posted something Asked she posted a, a question asking, how do you define strength? And I answered with three, three words. I said, resilience, courage, and acceptance. So I think the second thing I would add is courage, it's courage. And, and what I mean by courage is that old Mark Twain definition, which is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Although that's not his, his definition is more like, and I don't know if I'm going to get this word for word, but it's more like courage is not the absence of fear. It's the presence of fear and moving forward regardless. And so courage, uh, certainly a word that's 
particularly been present for me even more lately with, frankly, this opera, for instance, and being having playing the lead in this role is definitely going to take courage. And then the third thing I would say is, um, gosh, just three. <laughs> I, well, I almost said acceptance, but then when I really want to, I think what I really want to say is, you know, my mom died when I was 31. I was very blessed to have, you know, an unconditionally loving mother who asked me if I was gay, for instance, because she, she had already accepted it, which is interesting because what I, I wanted to say acceptance, but what I also want to say is unconditional loving. And as I tell that story, I realized that she demonstrated acceptance way back when I had no idea at the time. But as I say it now, I'm realizing she Right. Yeah, she demonstrated acceptance. She taught me unconditional loving and non-judgment, non-judgment. And yeah, she taught me that, for instance, you know, the color of a person's skin has nothing to do with who they are, that kind of thing. Although well, that isn't true. It trivializes race. Race is a real thing. And people have their own cultural experiences through race, but it doesn't. You, I think you understand what right. I'm saying. Anything you want to add? Gosh, you just you just stumped me right there. Is there anything I want to add? <laughs> you said a lot. Those, I those did. Three, I said those a lot. Three thing, those three things were really good. Because uh, I, I normally say at the end of a podcast, I say, is there anything you want to share with anybody that you've learned? But I think you've given them three things. But it, I also want to give you the opportunity if you want to add anything. Of course, when you drive away, you're going to get, you're going to go, oh, oh, of course, I, I wanted to said add that. Da, da, da. Yeah. Well, of, of course, of course. Because I've heard back from people saying, oh, I should have said this or yeah. I should have said that. Let me, well, that's a good, then that's a good question. Let me just do a quick review here. There's not a whole lot I want to add. There's not a whole lot I want to add. That was very succinct and good stuff you had. You did on your three things. I like those. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very good. Well, thank you for coming in, sir. You are welcome. I, I definitely appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. And you're welcome. And by the way, I will, whatever links you want for your different ventures, we'll put that in the uh, episode notes. That would be fantastic. So people can find you or ask you questions. If you want to get the questions, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, sure. But uh, anything you want in there will be sure. in there. So thanks again for coming in. Great. Thank you. Take care.